This episode is brought to you by Glenn Fittick, Fire and Kane. Just like jazz and funk fuse together to make hip hop, Fire and Kane blends the flavors of smoky and sweet, creating a perfectly smooth and balanced flavor combination. Glenn Fittick, Fire and Kane is the first peated whiskey to be finished in South American rum casks, making it seductively rich and easy to drink. Stay tuned after the episode for more tasting notes and a conversation with Glenn Fittick's brand ambassador, Alan Roth. In the 1970s and 80s, there was a revolution in Nashville that was every bit as important to country music as the Beatles were to rock and roll. A new generation of songwriters came along who didn't just want to write about cowboys and pickup trucks. They wanted to write about emotion and conflict and to bear their souls. My name is Bobby Braddock, and I'm, I'm bald, and I write songs, and, and, and borderline mentally ill. I'm Don Henry, and I've been very spoiled being able to enjoy what I love doing for the longest time, and I, I still continue to do it to this day. I'm Don Schlitz, and I, with no particular talent at all, I was 20 years old and uh, $80 and got off a bus, and I was in Nashville. My name is Malcolm Gladwell. You're listening to Broken Record. For this episode, I went to Nashville and sat down with three of the leaders of that revolution. Don Schlitz, who has written some of the greatest country music songs ever. Don Henry, the junior member of the revolution. And the great Bobby Braddock, elder statesman. Those of you who listen to my other podcast, Revisionist History, know that I can't set foot in Nashville without checking in with Bobby Braddock. It would be like going to Iceland and not saying hi to Bjork. We all met at Sony Tree Studios on Music Row. We talked for hours and could have talked for a lot longer. In fact, we could devote an entire season of Broken Record just to those crucial Nashville years. So consider this a start. Chapter one in the oral history of the new Nashville. I made sure there was a piano for Bobby, and the two Dons brought their guitars. I told them all they had to sing for their supper. Don Schlitz kicked things off. On a warm summer's evening, on a train bound for nowhere, I bet up with the gambler, we were both too tired to sleep. So we took turns of staring out the window at the darkness. The boredom overtook us And he commenced to speak And he said, son, I've made a life Out of reading people's faces And knowing what their cards were By the way they held their eyes And if you don't mind my saying I can see you're out of aces For a taste of your whiskey I'll give you some advice So I handed him my bottle he drank down my last swallow And then he bummed a cigarette And then he bummed a light And the night got deathly quiet His face lost all expression He said, if you're gonna play the game, kid You gotta learn to play it right Cause every gambler knows That the secret to surviving Is knowing what to throw away Knowing what to keep, cause every hand's a winner Like every hand's a loser And the best that you can hope for Is to die in your sleep You got to know when to hold them Know when to fold them And know when to walk away And know when to run, you never count your money When you're sitting at the table There'll be time enough for counting when the deal is done. And it only took two years to get it cut. Why? Because it was I, it was too long. It's too linear melodically. There's no a romantic situation. Uh, I there it, it's um, it took too long to go to the course. Uh, I don't know. I liked it. A lot of people liked it. And it finally 
nobody would cut it. And my publisher put out the demo and sent it to radio and they started playing it. A couple, uh, a friend of mine and named Hugh Moffat cut it and put it out. And Conway Twitty's son put it out, Charlie Tango. And suddenly there were three cuts of it on the, on the charts. And then it was gone and I was still working as a computer operator. Oh, you were still, good. you were still in. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. you know, yeah, writers got writers got to eat. Uh, but, but what I think is great about that song, it's full of life lessons. Like I don't play poker, but I don't back either. then I, I I played a lot of poker, and I would always think about the lines in that song. Okay, no one to fo- you know, and I use that, and and that's like a metaphor for the real life lessons that matter more than poker. And it's it's full of those, and you can just. You could write that down and carry it with you, and get it out and look at it when you're in a, in a tight situation. You know, does that does that song change? Does the success of that song change what people consider to be acceptable in a country song? I think it did. Uh, I, I know, and with all humility, I, I, what it changed for me. For eventually, Kenny Rogers cuts it, and with that great voice, they make it up tempo, they move the chorus up, and that made it so I could write whatever I wanted to write the rest of my life. And I, one thing I did not want to write was that song over and over again. So I got to write different songs. I got to emulate my pals who were also my heroes, though, you know, you wouldn't tell them that. Uh, and you, the, the, you, you write what you want to write, and, and you learn that you can, uh, amazingly enough, you have good taste. There's an interesting thing that happened with with uh, Braddock and Harlan and a uh, man named Bob McDill in this town uh, that you can see a difference between Nashville songs uh, or songs that were written on Music Row uh, that stopped being corny, stopped being that you'd sit on a hay bale and sing or on a bar stool and have to sing, but you could sit by yourself quietly in a room and go like that song is about me that song is about real issues that i have it is not uh and and we while we have heroes uh from that era like randy newman uh bob mcdill bob mcdill sorry bob dylan (laughs) um and you know uh gordon lightfoot those and great writers, uh, Joni Mitchell. You, I know you. you were, Paul were, Simon. Were, Paul. Well, Paul sure. Simon. Yeah. Uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon and yes, Keith Richards and, and Mick Jagger, who were writing songs that we love. There's an awful lot of, and, and Holland does your Holland. Do not leave out. I know this rating. Uh, uh, Motown and, and Stacks. Uh, that feeling, 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 and we're writing um, a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Chris Tarverson had an awful lot to do in popularizing that. I think Braddock had a lot to do in popularizing that. A, there is a sequence of events that happens. And as opposed to telling you, I feel this way, I feel this way, we're saying, this is what happened, period. And I think feelings go beyond words. That's why some of my – me, it's hard to differentiate between uh, maybe if I say my favorite song, it might be one of my favorite records. Like I put Go Rest High on that mountain on my list because just what happened in that studio when Ricky Skaggs and Patty Loveless were seen with Vince on that thing, I still get tears in my eyes and chill bumps when I hear that thing. And, you know, it's a great story, but they could be singing it in, in Greek, you yeah. know, and, and, and I'd still love it. Well, you know, uh, we also had the advantage, at least Don and I did, of, of tuning into country radio and having people like, like Christopherson or Tom T. Hall who were writing stories. And a lot of times you, you had to sit in that chair and listen all the way to the end to get the payoff. So you had people that is unlike today where you want the payoff in 10 seconds. Uh, people were willing to listen a little longer for something. There's, there's, there's a collective ADHD now mm-hmm. where people don't want to, I mean, A&R people, the, They'll if if it takes too long, like my song, he stopped loving her today, which I wrote with Curly Putman. Nobody would possibly cut that now because it takes too long to get to the payoff. They even they're even wanting now the second verse to be just a little tiny verse, you know. Whereas the second verse for us was 
you know, we were told if we had a great first verse, that might be your second verse. Yeah. Yes. It has mm-hmm. to be. Because yeah. you want something to build up to. Give me, what's, what's, a, what's a, a great example, another great example of a, uh, a song with a delayed payoff? Well, Can, that, that was one for sure. Yeah. Is, long, is, long, is Long Dark Vale? Well, you, you find out pretty quick that it's his best friend's. He was in the arms of his best friend's wife. Uh, kind of what, yeah. by the second, and she, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know he can't. He's got a decision to make, and well, and then you know that if she Wait, walks, do you, guys, do you guys know that song well enough to play it? Yeah, uh, Don good. probably. Uh, Can you? The most powerful part of that, I think, is when you say, "She walks these hills, oh, long black these hills, hills in a long black van. This is my grave where the night winds." Wait, nobody knows, nobody sees, nobody knows but me. Well, the scaffold was high and eternity near. She stood in the crowd and shed not a tear, but some. Where the cold wind blows in a long black veil, she cries o'er my bones. She walks these hills. Danny Dell and, and Mary John Wilkins. Danny yeah. Dell, I think, was primarily the lyricist on that. I heard they, now, is this true or not? They wrote it on the way to the session. Is that true? I don't know if that's true or not, but, but, uh, I had a song called Golden Ring. Uh-huh. That we were talking about whether we should sue Conway Twitty when he had I Love to Lay You Down. And I said, and I told my publisher, I said, if they do that, then Danny Dell and Mary John Wilkin may sue me for stealing the melody from Long Black Veil. Vale. And I told that story to Mary John Wilkin. She said, we came pretty damn close to doing wow. it. Really? really? <laughs> wow. My goodness. That's Wait. strange. Uh, well, well, I like, well, I like this theme that we're on well, of these kind of story that that are because a lot of you guys are seem to be a, have worked in that. Well, I, I was a, a huge and still am a huge Randy Newman fan. And the thing that struck me about Bobby when before I even really got to know him was that he was basically the country music version of that. And and I think the thing that really woke me up to that was, uh, unfortunately, when I heard he stopped loving her today. I knew the title of it before I heard the song. I wish I'd heard it w- without knowing what the name of the song was because the first line is, he said, I'll love you till I die. And I just started laughing so hard. I took the record off. I went, because the title is, he stopped loving her today. <laughs> and the first line is, he said, I'll love you till I die. And I went, oh, he's dead. This guy's dead, man. Oh, you got it instantly. Instantly. And I, went, I just started, and, and I, I think what I loved about Bobby and what I loved about the Lubin brothers and Tom T. Hall and so much stuff is that uh, thread of irony that you wouldn't call it laugh out loud humor, but it's, it's just so ironic. And to me, that's what Randy Newman taps into constantly. And so when I heard that song, and you know, every verse of He Stopped Loving Her Today ends with a joke. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we all went to see her when I, uh, she, we all wondered if she would. It kept running through my mind. This time he's over her for good. And then the th- thing about the smile, um, first time we'd seen him smile in years. Well, that's a joke. It those is. Are, it is. Those it's are a, jokes. It's, it's a funeral and almost joke, every yeah. one of them ends with that. But by the time you get that joke, it doesn't make you laugh. It makes you just get this biggest lump in your throat and you realize what a comedy tragedy life is. See, and, I always love the juxtaposition between something that... that me was, too. And, and, and I have written songs that I thought were funny songs and people took them very seriously and vice versa. Absolutely. That's happened to me over and over. You know? I love writing a song that it's, it, 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 it's really very serious but it's kind of taboo subject matter. Yeah. So people laugh nervously over that. Exactly. And that's what happened to me when I heard he stopped loving her today. And I use it today. To this day, I, I get to tour and teach and on some of these shows that I do. And I, I put that song up right away because I, I show people what you can do in such a short amount of time, 
how you can tell a huge story. And it uses all the little technical things about, uh, about that little running joke, uh, even the production of it, which is brilliant, Billy Sherrill. And I, I think, to me, I hold it up there with a song like we talked about earlier, like Sail Away, yeah. which you can almost use and, and show students or anybody who's interested how you can unfold a story. He said, I love you till I die. She told him you'll forget in time. But as the years went slowly by, she still prayed upon his mind. He kept her picture on the wall. We'll have crazy now and then He still loved her through it all Hoping she'd come back again Found some letters by his bed Dated 1962 He had underlined in red Every single I love you I went to see him just today Oh, but I didn't see no tears All dressed up to go First time I'd seen him smile in years He stopped loving her today They placed a wreath upon his door Soon they'll carry him away He stopped loving her today You know, she came to see him one last time. Oh, we all wondered if she would. You know, it kept running through my mind. This time he's over her for good. He stopped loving her today. They placed a wreath upon his door Soon they'll carry him away He stopped loving her today We'll be back with more of my conversation with Bobby Braddock, Don Schlitz, and Don Henry. We're back with Bobby and the Two Dons. Don Henry, a self-described hippie from California, wrote a hit record for Miranda Lambert with songwriter Philip Coleman, who's from West Tennessee. The song, All Kinds of Kinds, is an ode to diversity. I asked Don to play it for us. Ilsa was an acrobat who up and fell in love with that Horatio the human cannonball. A wedding neat the big top tent with barkers, clowns, and elephants, sideshow family oddities and all. The dog faced boy howled out with joy as the tattooed lady was crying. Ever since the beginning. To keep the world a spinning, it takes all kinds of kinds. Now Thomas was a congressman with closets full of skeletons and dresses that he wore on Friday nights. And 
Phyllis was a pharmacist A dab of that, a pinch of this Concocted to suppress her appetite And when the children were fiddling She'd slip them some riddling And wait for Thomasina to arrive Ever since the beginning To keep the world spinning It takes all kinds of kinds play this old guitar from children's shows to smoky bars I take a break and I think about the past how everybody stared at me when I stood up in geometry and I tossed my text into the trash I scratched off my number while hitching out under that bush league population sign ever since the beginning to keep the world spinning all kinds of kinds Now some point a finger And let ignorance linger If they look in the mirror They'd find Ever since the beginning To keep the world spinning It takes all kinds of kinds Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. <laughs> Yeah. You know, we knew when we wrote that we ha we had to kind of, uh, as as oddballs go, we were odder than the people we were t picking on at the front. So we had to put ourselves in there at the end <laughs> to show you that it's it's uh, that you know that we were there too. Otherwise, it's just a you getting on a soapbox and you're pointing fingers, and you really got to pay attention at pointing the finger at yourself uh, to make that kind of stuff work. At least from my experience and. And that, that's how it finally came together at the end for us. I love what she did. She she twisted it around a little bit. One of the things she said on that tag was, uh, so, instead of some point of finger, she says, at some point the finger. Yeah, That's yeah. the way she says it, which I think is great because she kind of owns that song. It sounds like she wrote it, and I like that. She's she's impish. Perfect yeah. song for her. She, it's yeah. perfect. It sounds, yeah. And that's what she told Frank Liddell, who produced that record. She said... Uh, it just sounds like something I would write. And that made me feel good because yeah. she's a really good writer. She I is. Yeah. Did, were you thinking about her when you no, wrote it? No. no we were, in fact, when we wrote that, it was it was probably probably 10 years before she moved to town. She was probably 15 years old. Do you guys, do you, when, you're, when you're writing songs, and I know uh, if you're not writing with the artist, but you're writing a song, do you have in your head anybody singing it other than yourself? No. I don't. I mean, I just, I just want to sing it at the Bluebird or wherever uh, if I'm, I'm singing. If I'm trying to emulate one of my heroes, like a Joni or something, I'll say, okay, what would Joni do? And I'll try to bring that out, but it's not like I'm writing to pitch that Wait, song. you have Joni Mitchell in your head? I love Joni Mitchell. When I'm looking to write a song and I can't really get into the groove, I'll get up early in the morning, get things going, and put on Joni Mitchell. Wow. Randy Newman. Paul Simon, sometimes people like Van Morrison. I really like because mm -hmm. I just like the way he writes words. That Great just music feel can good. Pump, pump you up and make it you feel pumps like you up. That, yeah. That. If if you could only listen to one Joni Mitchell song in the morning to get you going, what would it be? Well, for writing and for working on that, it's it's a tough one. But but for me, it's it was on my list, and it's both sides now. It's clouds, yeah. because I remember distinctly as a youngster hearing that song and going. Oh, see what she did there? You know, that kind of a thing. And that's that same anchor of a chorus that has a little bit of a twist each time it comes back around. Yeah. And I, I think, well, that keeps the listener from being bored, doesn't it? And yet it's, it's just filled with life lessons it's written by such a young person at the time. And I think by hearing something like that at an early age, it helped make me wiser quicker. Uh, you know, as much as I loved Bubblegum Pop, to hear mm -hmm. Joni Mitchell sing that, it was like, oh, this is what you can do with it's something. It's a pretty cool chord changes. In it it's too. pretty amazing, yeah. But the one man band by the quick lunch stand, oh, he was playing for real good for free. For free, for free. Yeah. I mean, what a great country song that is. He could, yeah. All her, you know? it, it, it I, I almost want to. Can you guys do me a little bit of that song all together? Is that possible? Um, <laughs> it was good. You know, I don't know enough of it. At clouds from both sides now. From up and down, and then give or take, and win or lose. Still she somehow. Now. It's a cloud, clouds, illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds. 
at all. I really. It's funny because she originally did it in that key. In that key. Yeah. So yeah, like, yeah. Nobody knows that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I what I lo- I like about that thing is is uh, it it's kind of it's it's very textbooky and it's very technical, but when it's when it's going down, it's seamless and it doesn't feel that way. When you were talking about how to hear that from someone so young, it's a totally better song. Yeah. Written, sung by someone who's obviously really young, right? Because it's no longer the, it's not the cliche of the older person yeah. looking back. It's this That's right. yeah. weird, fascinating thing of this so, super young person saying, you're not going to believe this. Amazement. Yeah. <laughs> but I have looked at life from both sides now, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Dylan did that constantly, you know, looking at his, I remember the first time I heard the girl from the North Country, my dad used to sing that one all the time to me. And I didn't even know who Bob Dylan was when he, my dad would sing it. And then, uh, he had that Free Willin' album, and uh, I remember thinking that this was f- completely different than anything I'd heard, because uh, this guy was really young, writing about such wise stuff. It was really cool. We'll be back with more Broken Record after this. I'm back with Bobby Braddock, Don Henry, and Don Schlitz. Don, back to you. <clears throat> Can you give us... Now I'm interested in... Uh, a song that really, ch- not one of your own, a song that really kind of tra- thought, changed the way, transformed the way you thought about songwriting, that opened a door for you. Fairly easy to uh, to explain. My uh, first company I went to in Nashville when I was 20 was Pete Drake Music, because Pete Drake had played on John Wesley Harding, and there was a young man named uh, Buzz Rabin was uh, listening to songs there. And, uh, but I played, you know, I, I, I walked in, I had hair down halfway down my back and I was 20 years old and didn't look like a person that would be in, in, uh, uh, wanting to be a country singer. And so I went up and played a few songs for him at the publishing company. And he said, well, I don't really know, um, what we're doing here yet, what I'm doing here yet, but let me make a phone call for you. He gave me a number, a person to go see. He says, you'll go see him in a couple of days. He's, he'll be expecting you. So I go over to this company, this building, walking. I didn't have a car. Uh, and this hot uh, day in, I think it's April, you know, heavy guitar case. And I walk in. Back then, you could walk in. And I said, I'm supposed to see somebody. My name is. And uh, somebody yells back. Uh, oh, I know what this is about. He comes out, and this guy with uh, curly hair and wire rim glasses comes out and says, "Come on back and play some songs." So I went back and I pulled my guitar out and I played a couple songs. And he says, "Well, play me another." And I'm pretty sure that I'm this guy's big break. You know that I am it for him. This is a, and I'm going through. And I play about eight or nine songs, and I'm thinking I'm being discovered. This is absolutely amazing and wonderful. I'm 20 years old, and this is how great for this this guy. He's like 10 years older than me, and uh, he says, well, "Let me show you what what uh, what I do." And uh, he says, "Come on in here." He takes me into the little record room and says, "Well, it's just a single." And I knew that didn't mean it was very much because it wasn't on an album. And it's a small label, and it's a friend of mine. It's the B side, and he puts on this song and the. Uh, <laughs> And it starts to play. And, uh, well, I've held it all in me. Lord knows I've tried. It's an awful awakening. <laughs> and country <laughs> boys lie. The song was Amanda. Wait, keep going. <laughs> I wish I could, but I can't do it justice because the singer was Don Williams. And uh, it was on JMI Records. It was uh, it's, it's 12 lines. Uh, and it was uh, a song called Amanda. He didn't tell me that he'd written it by himself. Or that he'd also written the A side, which was "Come Early Morning," which was the number one song in America at the time. Uh, and I'm sitting there listening, going like, "Uh oh, you know, I've got a long way to go." <laughs> and I think that what it changed for me was realizing that I didn't know a whole lot. He's talking and about he, Bob McDill. Talk about Bob McDill was the man, and he became my mentor, and basically the only person that would see me for a few years mm-hmm. when I was first here, and the only person I would go and, and take songs to. And uh, of course, he passed on the gambler, which was you know. So he everybody makes mistakes, but he went on to write a uh, um, a, a large portion of the Don Williams songs mm-hmm. uh, that that uh, that helped change this town. And uh, he wrote uh, "Good Old Boys Like Good me. Old Boys Like Me" was is, is oh his masterpiece. God. Give us give, give us a taste of it. 
When I was a kid, Uncle Remus, he put me to bed With a picture of Stonewall Jackson above my head And Daddy came in to kiss his little man With gin on his breath and a Bible in his hand He talked about honor and things I should know And he staggered a little as he went out the door I can still hear the soft southern winds in the live oak trees Those Williams boys, they still mean a lot to me Hank in Tennessee I guess we're all gonna be what we're gonna be So what do you do with good old boys like me? Hey, we were we were we were lucky. Uh, at least I was. I had just come to town in '79, so all this stuff was happening. Um, the Gambler had just been a huge hit, and and then a year later, he stopped loving her. Today was, of course, uh, good old boys like me and stuff like that. So that was the bar that I had to come in, and I thought, well, that's an impossible bar to reach, but it it was glorious and it was fun to try. No, but it, it was a wonderful club to it, join, it which was, you did. It was, and yeah. I and I I think that that's frustrating now is that a song that would say something like Hank in Tennessee or a song like He Stopped Loving Her Today or unfortunately The Gambler would not be recorded today. Oh. And that's a frustrating feeling. And so that bar that I held mm-hmm. so high, it's a different bar now. I'm not saying that it's, I don't know because I don't participate in that world uh, like I did back then. But uh, What I wanted to say about Amanda being so simple is then we ended up going with a, when uh, Paul Overstreet and I were writing songs and actually would find, oh, goodness gracious, uh, in the the middle, would find an idea and then write, on the other hand, there's a golden band. It sounds like a Braddock song, doesn't it? To remind me of someone would not understand on the one hand I could stay and be your loving man but the reason I must go is on the other hand and it's just a you know, real when that, that's a 12 line song uh, a 12 line song that, that we also wrote was like a uh, a smile on your face lets me know that you need me There's a truth in your eyes says you'll never leave me A touch of your hand says you'll catch me if ever I fall Can you say it best when you say nothing at all? Real simple Wait, that's song. your song? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I had no idea. It, was a, my, hit. it but, was a hit twice. It's one of my favorite songs. I've only Thank ever you. heard the, um, I think it's an astounding song. Hey, I've Keith, only ever heard the version Alison by Krause. Alison Krauss. Yeah. Keith, Keith Whitley recorded Whitley it. Version too. Yeah. Uh, Keith Whitley recorded it first, uh-huh. and he, then he passed away, sadly. He's a, he was one of our great singers, and it was yeah. tragically. And there was a, uh, a tribute album made, and, and Alison Krauss sang it, and then... There's this movie comes out, and I my understanding is, uh, in the movie the the people, Ronan Keating is the guy's name from a group called Boyzone, uh, calls Allison Krauss's office and asks for permission to 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 sing the song. At which point I think they said, you know, you really probably should talk to the publisher and the writer, and they put it in a movie called Notting Hill, and it was a pop record all over. Oh, that's right. Oh, the world right, actually, at, actually, and it occurs at forty-five and a half minutes into Notting Hill. So if yeah. you see it, uh, as I often do on television, because it runs all the time, yeah. and you can just time it, and I'll yell, "Stacy, <laughs> it's on, it's on." <laughs> if there's ever, ever, if there was ever a perfect voice, it's Allison Krauss, man, Ama- oh, amazing voice. Oh, yeah. When you have to sing a song, I would love to sing mm-hmm. when I sing a song, rather than one of the hits. My favorite thing I've done in two or three years, and 
show you how I just changed a line. I knew that I needed to change that line to make, make it fit today's market. I hope I can read these lyrics here. And I'll probably just make all kind of mistakes and blow the whole thing, but I'm going to try this anyway. I try to mind my manners And I say sir and ma'am When I'm around my granny I don't say hell or damn I open doors for ladies Cause that's the way I am Way down deep In the southern part Try to be a good man in everything I do. Yes, I love my whiskey, but I love Jesus too. When I say I love you, baby, you know that it's true. Way down deep in the southern part of Sometimes when I'm drinking I don't know what I'm thinking And everybody's hating This drunken son of Satan Then I wake up so damn sorry In my softest part Way down deep In the southern part of my heart one night I got so offensive That I went on the defensive I said I'm not a bigot He said you just won't admit it Then I said I'm so damn sorry In my softest part Way down, way down deep In the southern part of my heart When I am an old man, skyscrapers all around Take me to the country and find some sacred ground Among the sweet magnolias, gently lay me down Way down, way down deep in the southern Southern part of my heart. Oh, that's man, a lovely that's song. Great, mm. thank you. I don't. I couldn't even hear all the words. Could you so read what, some what of is the, what is the line you changed? Here's a line I changed. The music, beautiful. Okay, that's why I was wondering if I should take the top down off the piano. Uh, what I had originally I said, I try to be a good man and everything. I, I try to put myself in the character of this guy who's kind of a typical Southerner. And being a Southerner, even though I've really evolved, I mean, I still have a lot of these things in here that, that I don't like about the South. I was that way myself. I mean, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I was a hardcore seg segregationist. I didn't think blacks and white people should go to school together. I really believe that shit. So the line I have here was... Uh, 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 I try to be a good man in everything I do. And the line I had was, uh, uh, you know, I love Jesus and I love my country too. And in the early 2000s, you could do that. You could do that when the, the country demographic was very conservative and there were all these patriotic songs. And country radio now, if you had something like God and country right together, I think they wouldn't play it because it would sound like it was political and they just don't want to go there because of the demographic, country demographic. It's like, it's like America itself. It's, it's split right down the middle. And, and it's controversial. They don't want controversy. They don't want somebody to turn the dial. They don't want to lose half of their audience. So, but you can still sing about Jesus. Occasionally, you know, you'll hear Jesus in a song and you can sure sing about whiskey. So I thought, 
man, what I'm going to do there then is said, yes, I love my whiskey, but I love Jesus too. And I think that made it probably acceptable today. Can I, can I, can I point out the, absur- the hilariously absurd irony of that? Yes. That it's more it, it acceptable is. now for us to talk about whiskey than country? It, huh? <laughs> yeah, you can talk for a about while you couldn't. Whiskey's yeah. fine. Yeah. Wh- whiskey's not divisive. But country is like... <laughs> um, hey, Bobby? <clears throat> if I played in D, if I played a little bit of Forever and Ever, can you play that? Yeah. Anything else, Billy? Really. They say time takes its toll on a body, makes a young girl's blonde hair turn gray. Honey, I don't care. I ain't in love with your hair. If it all fell out, I would love you anyway. And they say time it plays tricks on a memory. Makes a young man forget things they do It's easy to see, heaven knows it's happened to me I have already forgot every woman but you Oh sugar, I'm gonna love you forever Forever and ever, amen As long as old men sit and talk Backup vocals on that one. Yeah, there, yeah, you guys catch yeah. Are you union? <laughs> Are you union? I, I am not union. All right, Adam, he's not union. <laughs> there's, there's no card. That was Don Schlitz, Don Henry, and Bobby Braddock from Sony Tree Studios on Nashville's Music Row. Broken Record is produced by Justin Richmond and Jason Gambrell with help from Bruce Hadlam. Mia Lobel, Chiquita Pascal, Jacob Smith, Julia Barton, Jacob Weisberg, and of course, El Jefe, Rick Rubin. Special thanks to Adam Engelhardt, who engineered the session in Nashville. Our broken record theme music is by Evan Viola. To hear the songs featured in today's episode, sung by the artists who made them famous, check out brokenrecordpodcast.com. This show is brought to you by Pushkin Industries. I'm Malcolm Gladwell. This is Bruce Hedlum. I'm one of the hosts of Broken Record. And today we welcome Alan Roth, who's a brand ambassador for the legendary Scotch brand Glenfiddich. So tell me about what we're drinking today, which is called Fire and Cane. Fire and Cane is the newest Glenfiddich expression from the Experimental series. So one of the nice things about being family-owned and operated, as we have been for the last 130 years, is that the family has given the, the men and women who make Glenfiddich a lot of freedom to try new things. So we created this Experimental series in order to give the malt master, Brian Kinsman, the opportunity to accelerate that pace of innovation. So the first was an IPA cask finish. The second was something called Project 20, where we inverted the creative process, and ambassadors like myself actually chose the casks that inspired that flavor profile. The third was a 21-year ice wine finish that was absolutely spectacular. Uh, But I have to say, the one I'm drinking most often is the Fire and Cane that we have here. So this is a peated Glenfiddich, so it's going to be smoky, then finished in Latin rum casks to give it a nice round sweetness to complement that smokiness. Okay. Well, let's try some. By the way, you guys have the best titles. You've got malt masters. You're a brand ambassador. Do you get your own plates? Can you park anywhere? Are you like a regular ambassador? More alcohol, less immunity. Oh, okay. Is, is the way you do that. I like that. We're drinking this. We have a slightly tapered glass. 
what should you drink scotch in? You tell me. I mean, I just picked the nearest glass. So yes, this is a Glencairn glass, and it's wider at the base, tapers up towards the top, helps concentrate the aromas coming off the glass. I really put my nose right in there. If that's a little bit early for you, you can just put your nose and breathe in through your mouth. You'll get almost all the flavor, but very little of the alcohol. Oh, I like that. That's, that's really interesting. So you nose it, you know, and on the nose here, I'm getting, you know, first thing I get is that smoke, maybe some of the impression of that sweetness there, but really I'm getting a lot of, you know, kind of campfire. And the smoke comes from? So the smoke comes from the peat that is used to dry the barley. Okay, so how does that work? Yeah, so somewhere between a tree and coal is where right. peat lives as, as a substance. Now, normally we don't use peat to dry our barley. And so we have a non-smoky expression. In this case, what's in the glass is actually a combination of smoky and non-smoky Glenfiddich married together and then okay. finished in those, those Latin rum casks. But in the typical Glenfiddich, you're not getting a lot of smoke. That's not what people expect from you guys. That's correct. This is, this is a real innovation for us. It's the first Bayside single malt that's peated and finished in rum casks. So I definitely get the smoke on the nose, maybe kind of a slight impression of some sweetness. And then I just take a sip. You know, if the, the alcohol overwhelms you at the beginning, take a sip and then give yourself a moment and then take a second sip and let that second sip really be where you start to look for the the flavors that you're going to get from the whiskey. And so, you know, I get that. I get that campfire smokiness for sure. Um, I get a nice kind of almost like caramel sweetness. And then sometimes if, if the balance is just right, I'll get the sensation of toasted marshmallow. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, let's have another sip of this. So we're nosing it. I didn't know nose was a verb. And actually, if the whiskey tastes as it smells, the mouth follows the nose. No, I like that. Shouldn't you, you should have a whole line called The Mouth Follows the Nose. It would completely work. So what else do I need to know about fire and cane? The most important thing that you're going to, that you need to know is really just what your palate is telling you right now. You know, the smoke that you're getting, the sweetness that you're getting. And this is a whiskey that can really present two different ways to drinkers. Some days I'll get more of the smokiness. Some days I'll get more of the sweetness. But the important thing is that, you know, the flavors really meld together in a way that's balanced. I didn't expect the sweetness in that, and I don't associate scotch with sweetness. I get the fire, not the cane, usually. And people who don't like scotch, and I think that's they're not getting that sweetness. Fire and cane, the sweetness here, is really coming from both the sweetness that's within Glenfiddich's spirit, but then obviously accentuated through that Latin rum cask, which is seasoned with a really robust rum, which is able to compete with that smokiness and, and then still really come through. I couldn't be happier about it. I was, I was thrilled when I found out this was in development. Love tasting some of the early versions, but like everything that I've tasted that's, that's come before it, the final version that Brian comes up with is incredible. Fire and Cane is a permanent addition to the experimental series, and it's continuing to roll out all over the world. Okay, so what are we going to expect next after Fire and Cane? Ooh. So we do have some exciting things uh, in the pipeline for the next couple of years, but those are closely guarded secrets. That was Broken Records Bruce Hadlam with Glenfiddich's Alan Roth. Thanks again to Glenfiddich, Fire, and Kane.